Thank you all. Good afternoon to all those attending in our local time zone. And good morning, good evening to everyone else tuning in from abroad. I'm truly thrilled, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome you to this very fine addition to our series of mentoring talks. We are very honored to host here today one of the foremost women in academia, Professor Jean Ambao, for our 26th mentoring talk, the first mentoring talk for this academic year. During these dire conditions in Lebanon, our distinguished guest is here today to light a candle in our darkness. Our esteemed guest is a holder of many prestigious accolades. Professor Bao is among the top most ever cited female researchers. Her current H index is 192 with almost 140,000 citations. She is the chairperson of the chemical engineering department at Stanford University. Even though Professor Bao has always been a very modest person, she always dreams big and keeps looking for new challenges. She believes that the research she is working on, which involves mimicking the human, the human skin to design electronic devices that are stretchable, self-healing, and homogeneously effective, will reach its peak in the next 10 to 20 years. Professor Bao aims to use these devices to transform the world and provide a new generation of medical devices. Yet, we are not inviting Professor Bao to talk about her grandiose research accomplishments, but rather we ask her to shed light on her failures and obstacles. Professor Bao was born and raised in Nanjing, China. She grew up in a household of scientists in which her father broadened her curiosity regarding scientific questions of the universe at a very early age of three years old. He asked her whether a popsicle would float or sink in the lake and she believed it would sink. So her father asked her to throw her popsicle in the lake to test her anticipation. And rather than sinking, the popsicle floated. This experiment has taught her the first concept of science, density. Professor Bao believes that it was this incident that inspired her to become what she is today and what she aspires to be in the future. Her family immigrated during her undergraduate studies into a modest house in the United States to provide her with a better education. She used to work multiple jobs, from working at a factory to working part-time at a supermarket alongside her education to support her parents. Being a mother of two beautiful kids, she dedicates all her spare time to her children and enjoys hiking and cooking with them. As a greatly established researcher, Professor Bao believes that the role of women in STEM should be encouraged by raising awareness and implementing policies that ensure gender equity. Without further ado, I shall now leave the floor entirely to the Professor of the Hour, Jean and Bao, so we, so we may all learn together how she has moved through hardship to the stars. Professor Bao, the floor is yours. Thanks uh, so much, uh, Professor Kafarani, and thanks so much for the invitation uh, to, to share a little bit about my uh, own experience, uh, uh, kind of coming a long way from, um, uh, from China to US uh, and uh, then uh, starting my own academic career. Uh, so, so my my plan is uh, to um, uh, to to uh, start with a, a little bit uh, of uh, some slides uh, that hi, uh, helps uh, to uh, guide my talk, and uh, uh, then uh, I'll open up to uh, any questions uh, uh, you might have and uh, have um, a conversation with you. Uh, so, uh, I would love to to hear from you and uh, your questions. Uh, as um, uh, Professor uh, Kafarani already mentioned, uh, that uh, I grew up uh, in China, 
And uh, this is a, a kind of a brief timeline of uh, uh, the important things that happened uh, in my uh, career and in my life. Uh, I grew up in China and then came to the United States um, when I was in college uh, in 1990. Uh, some of you uh, probably were not even born uh, at that time. Uh, that's the time when China just started to open up to the Western world. And uh, my uh, grandma uh, has been living in the US, so we immigrated uh, at the time. And uh, then uh, I worked in factories supermarket uh, for a year or so to support myself um, uh, and uh, finished uh, uh, college and uh, then went to University of Chicago to um, uh, study graduate school and then went to Bell Laboratories, um, uh, worked there for eight years uh, and then uh, Stanford. And I uh, got my PhD in 1995 uh, in Bell Labs, uh, became a um, distinguished uh, member of technical staff in early 2000. Uh, then uh, in Stanford, they don't hire people who, um, uh, who has not had uh, uh, any teaching experience. Uh, so uh, even though I have been out of PhD for a while, I had to earn my tenure. And uh, after that, uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, I became department chair. Actually, I just finished my term. Uh, now happy to start my sabbatical right now. Uh, along the way, I started um, Two companies uh, and also established uh, a uh, initiative in Stanford. Uh, so my plan is to, um, uh, since we're talking about mentorship and uh, uh, learning and the career path, uh, so my plan is to tell you a little bit uh, about each stage and what I learned uh, throughout uh, my career and share with you my experience and uh, then a few thoughts uh, about. Um, um, uh, Looking back, what what I think are the uh, are the major uh, major learnings uh, I had throughout my journey. Uh, so, grew up um, uh, in China, Nanjing, China. Actually, it's uh, uh, kind of in the middle of China, very close to Shanghai. Now, with the fast speed train, it takes uh, uh, only a little bit over three hours uh, to get from Nanjing to um, uh, to Shanghai. So that's where I grew up. Uh, and uh, growing up, uh, there, there's something. Uh, the uh, of course uh, the um, uh, my father as mentioned uh, uh, by uh, Professor Car uh, Kafarani that uh, he was a major inspiration. He was a physicist, and uh, my mother was a chemist, and uh, they. Um, actually, I, I I never remember they asked me to study or or to to push me to uh, to have better grades. All I remember was that uh, they they asked me to to um, go to the nature to play more or ask me questions uh, uh, like the popsicle questions uh, why popsicle would flow or why ants would be um, running uh, or, or coming out of their nest uh, when it rains, and another thing that's uh, very special about uh, where I lived uh, in Nanjing was that they have uh, this beautiful stone uh, that's uh, unique to that region. And uh, I've always fascinated with uh, uh, these uh, stone and, uh, and this is what you would be able to buy in stores. Uh, but uh, in the sand in where I play in the playground or uh, places so we go hiking. Uh, there are little sand uh, where I can find uh, fractions of stone that kind of as part of these kinds of beautiful stones. And it always uh, gives me uh, great pleasure when I um, uh, when I discover a small piece and then that made me imagine how beautiful they could be uh, if I get the, uh, the entire intact piece. Uh, so that that uh, joy of being able to really uh, look through nature or look through um, uh, kind of uh, later on experiments to discover uh, things uh, that could be beautiful and unexpected has always been something that I think I truly enjoy as part of research. 
But um, at that time, also, um, uh, as part of my um, college study, uh, I already started to receive mentorship and mentorship has been uh, tremendously important uh, for for my uh, defining my career or throughout my career. Uh, this is uh, Professor Qi Xue. Uh, he uh, is a well-known polymer physicist. Um, and um, when I was in college, uh, uh, he gave me the opportunity to do a summer research in his group. At the time, I uh, did not know that much about polymers. Uh, and I remember made some polymers, uh, but what I remember most was that I was able to have a material. It was kind of gooey and uh, sticky, uh, but I was able to hold it in my hand and uh, play with it. And I found it fascinating. And uh, Professor uh, uh, Xue was really the person who um, uh, who introduced me to uh, polymer field. And then uh, 1990, I immigrated to the uh, United States, and I was very fortunate uh, to be admitted to University of uh, Chicago. So this is the campus, and uh, in the background is the uh, beautiful Lake Michigan. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, somewhere, uh, somewhere uh, my arrow is pointing is uh, where uh, the, uh, actually towards the other side was where the chemistry department was. It's a beautiful institution. And even when walking, I recently went back to Chicago to receive uh, a uh, uh, distinguished alumni award. Uh, but even walking on campus, I can feel the, the air of uh, scholarship uh, and uh, just the the, uh, the the very high level of um, uh, of uh, uh, scholarship uh, uh, even on the campus. Uh, so I was very fortunate to, to be admitted there, and also even more fortunate uh, to um, to uh, have my PhD advisor Lu Ping Yu, uh, who actually joined the U Chicago. Uh, the same year I got admitted, and he was the first uh, person uh, in Chicago who started uh, doing research um, on polymer chemistry. Uh, and um, I, I went to Chicago actually uh, mainly because my relatives were in Chicago and I did not want to move too far away. And I didn't have an undergrad degree. Actually, I didn't have my bachelor's degree due to very complicated um, uh, situation at that time. Uh, and U Chicago uh, admitted me even without an undergrad degree. So uh, that was an easy choice. I just went there. There. And uh, I did not really know who uh, were the professors there. I just knew that Chicago, U Chicago, has one of the best chemistry department. Uh, so I could not go wrong. Uh, but then, very fortunate, uh, Professor Lu Ping Yu joined at the same time, and he was so kind and so easy to talk to. And uh, plus, I really enjoy polymer uh, work when I was in college in Professor Xue's group. Uh, so I uh, decided to um, uh, to join uh, Professor Lu Ping Yu's group. So in his group, uh, my work was uh, related to um, investigating, actually it's all about organic chemistry. I, I don't even, I didn't even remember why I was put into the organic chemistry uh, section in University of Chicago, uh, but I was put in there, so I started studying organic chemistry. And um, uh, my project was to investigate uh, palladium coupling reaction for making conjugated polymers. Uh, right now, these reactions are very commonly used to make all kinds of uh, conjugated polymers. Uh, but back then, uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, it was actually the very beginning when we started to investigate the, their utility for um, conjugate polymer synthesis. And what I want to pull your attention is that um, in 1993, uh, actually, uh, this is uh, uh, two years after I joined Lu Ping's group, uh, uh, you see that I was very fortunate 
have uh, three publications uh, uh, in in my um, uh, second year, and uh, this was because actually when I joined Lupin's group, um, uh, I even hardly know the English name of uh, beakers or flasks or condensers. When people, uh, when he told me or my lab mate told me uh, the um, uh, apparatus to use, I have to first translate and then figure out what is the apparatus and uh, be able to set up reactions. And that, that was my uh, kind of starting point of research. And I didn't know anything about how to do research. But Lu Ping was able to, as a, um, uh, a, a great mentor, he was able to choose problems that was simple enough for me to uh, get started, uh, to, to really learn about research, and then uh, helped me to learn to be productive very early on. And that was instrumental in helping me to build my own confidence to do research. Uh, he wrote the first paper here. You see his um, name was first because he actually wrote it, uh, even though I um, uh, was under his guidance, uh, did experiment, but he wrote the paper. So this was my first paper. And then I started learning how to write papers. Um, so this um, uh, was really uh, this productivity at the beginning was very uh, instrumental. And then the other thing I want to point out, that's why I show this um, uh, graph here. This is uh, uh, X-ray diffraction. Well, at the time we have uh, to use a camera to, or the detector uh, would expose the film and then we have camera to uh, uh, take an X-ray diffraction. But at the time, uh, the um, uh, when when I synthesized the polymer, and uh, uh, people have never observed uh, that conjugated polymer could also be liquid crystalline. And Lupin saw a paper uh, talking about rigid rod polymers being liquid crystalline. So he asked me to to uh, find a way to prove that our conjugated polymer could also be liquid crystalline. And having the X-ray diffraction uh, showing the order and at the different temperature was a really important experiment. Uh, but we did not have any of this instrument in the uh, in the chemistry department or in his lab. And that time, a shared facility was a novel idea. There wasn't any shared facility. So Lupin found out in the geophysics department. Uh, there is an X-ray diffraction. So he encouraged me to reach out to, to uh, talk to the people there to see if I could use it. So that was my first experience of really learning to, to reach out, to find, uh, seek uh, help and seek a collaboration. That's how I got this piece of data. Uh, and then another example of uh, him re uh, encouraging me to reach out was when I synthesized uh, this polymer here, has a large porphyrin uh, core. Uh, then um, uh, we thought, uh, and that's the time when atomic force microscopy first become available. And Lupin learned that uh, in the medical school, they have an AFM uh, system. Uh, so he, he thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if we can actually see this molecule where there's a large core uh, here? Uh, but of course, uh, the AFM that time was um, uh, uh, not nearly as sophisticated as today. Uh, and again, to take an AFM image, I have to um, um, First, take it, and then it's showing um, uh, in uh, in a camera. Then I take a picture from the camera, and then I have to go to a pharmacy to expose the uh, photo to eventually get the image. Uh, we were not able to see the single molecule, but again, uh, that experience uh, taught me to um, uh, to reach out to others, uh, uh, which was important for me to uh, get my job in Bell Laboratories. So by end of uh, my um, uh, fourth year or middle of fourth year, I graduated. Uh, uh, I was actually um, graduating before normal, uh, even though I didn't have any research experience uh, uh, because uh, uh, Lupin's guidance and uh, uh, helping me to uh, learn to do research very quickly. 
And um, uh, I joined the Bell Labs uh, uh, because um, uh, actually also coincidence, uh, because one of my friends in physical chemistry uh, suggested uh, that, well, Bell Labs, uh, they have lots of uh, uh, Nobel Prize uh, in physics, uh, in um, uh, uh, in science and um, uh, being a physical chemist, he was more familiar with uh, inventions from Bell Labs. Uh, and I was looking for postdoc position, uh, but I wasn't sure I want to do a postdoc or go to academia. Um, so I thought, well, industry might be an interesting place in between. So I applied for a postdoc job, um, but I got a, a regular job instead. So that made my decision easy. Uh, and I joined the Bell Labs uh, at end of uh, uh, my PhD, end of uh, 1995. And uh, there, the... Um, uh, the person that was really important in my uh, career was um, uh, was uh, uh, my manager, Elsa Rachmanis. Uh, uh, she was the uh, president of American Chemical Society um, uh, some years ago when I was in Bell Labs, uh, and uh, currently, uh, then he uh, she moved to Georgia Tech, became a professor there, uh, and now in uh, Lehigh University. And she was my um, uh, manager and also my first mentor uh, in uh, after I moved to Bell Labs. So when I started there, uh, I went to first day uh, going to work. I went to her office and asked her, uh, what project do you put me on or what project should I work on? So she just handed me uh, the keys. She said, Janan, here are the keys to your uh, office and to your lab. Talk to people and decide on what you want to work on. So that was um, uh, very unusual. Uh, probably uh, doesn't happen anymore in industry, but that's what Bell Labs was like. Basically, each researcher can uh, establish their own independent research. So I went around and talked to two people uh, for two weeks, uh, and um, uh, I found that Transistors, uh, one of the most basic elements uh, for uh, modern uh, modern microelectronics was invented uh, in Bell Labs. So you see 1956, uh, the uh, first transistor was uh, uh, invented and that was the uh, subject for 1956 the Nobel Prize. Actually, the invention was in 1948, I believe. Uh, and uh, also at the time, Bell Labs uh, uh, was just starting a, um, uh, the, uh, a research program on transistors uh, made with organic materials. So I talked to people for two weeks uh, and went around and uh, see different possibilities. I thought this could be an area that uh, my, uh, the book, <laughs> yeah, so that's a book, uh, organic transistor book that I edited. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, so so I, I, I thought this is an area I could make some uh, immediate contributions uh, because um, uh, uh, my background in synthesis of uh, molecules uh, that are related. So I started working in this uh, uh, area. Um, and then um, uh, Anand Stada Blapur, uh, so then I subsequently had a number of mentors uh, who were really important uh, uh, to, to my development. Uh, so there was, uh, first there was the uh, uh, Elsa, I already mentioned. Uh, and then Anand Stada Blapur was an uh, uh, electrical engineer. And uh, I, I uh, first uh, uh, determined uh, some molecules uh, and also synthesized some molecules uh, I thought could be promising. So I went to Anans and asked him uh, if he could uh, help to test my molecules. He said, well, Janan, as a physicist slash electrical engineer, I can be studying one molecule or one material for the rest of my career. I don't really have time to um, uh, to look at uh, too many molecules, but I can teach you how to make these uh, transistors and I can teach you uh, the uh, solid state physics uh, and then you can test uh, your own materials. Uh, so since then, he showed me how to make devices, 
Uh, and every week he would uh, give me a one hour small lecture or tutorial on uh, solid state physics and how transistor works and all the fundamentals. So that's how I learned about electronic devices and transistors. And the other person was uh, Howard Katz. Uh, he was uh, one of the uh, people together with uh, Anand Lapour started uh, tr organic transistor research in Bell Laboratories. Um, and uh, he set up uh, all the uh, purification set up and established the procedures uh, for evaluating uh, organic materials. Uh, uh, and um, uh, he was uh, the person also um, uh, that I had a lot of discussions uh, about molecular design because uh, he was also a chemist uh, uh, himself. Uh, the other person was uh, Andy Lovinger. Uh, he already became a program manager in the National Science Foundation when I moved to uh, Bell Labs. Uh, and he was uh, a uh, uh, expert on characterization of materials uh, using TEM uh, and X-ray diffraction. So he was among the first uh, to actually study these organic semiconductors uh, using those character characterization tools. Uh, but even though he was uh, already a full-time program manager at uh, NSF, he would uh, drive back, uh, uh, drive for maybe uh, six or uh, seven hours uh, uh, from Washington, D.C. back to um, uh, to Murray Hill, New Jersey, uh, every few months, uh, uh, initially every month, uh, uh, to uh, do experiments uh, to look at our materials. Uh, and also, uh, when I wrote my first paper, he was my co-author, and he was the one uh, that corrected my paper and uh, sit down with me to go through every line so to make sure that the language I used was, um, uh, was accurate. Uh, so he was uh, another really important mentor. Uh, then and uh, then Ed Chandras, he was my office uh, neighbor. Uh, he was someone who who knew everything about chemistry, physics, uh, and just you can go to him to ask about anything. Uh, and um, uh, he was the one also discovered uh, chemiluminescence. Uh, uh, so if you have play, uh, played with uh, those uh, stick at the party, you bend it uh, and then it will emit light. And that phenomenon was uh, discovered by Ed. Uh, and he would uh, just come by my office and uh, ask uh, how, I'm do how, how I was doing and what research I was working on. Uh, and he would uh, give me his critical opinions uh, about uh, what he thought about my project. Uh, so he, he was uh, someone that I frequently had discussions about projects uh, and uh, he was really uh, encouraging uh, me about pursuing different directions. And then Valerie uh, was another uh, technical staff uh, at Bell Labs, uh, and she was uh, uh, always a strong advocate uh, for women to pursue science. And uh, she, together with uh, uh, Elsa and uh, uh, all the other mentors, uh, would uh, would really watch out for me to um, uh, find opportunities for me or nominate me for awards and uh, uh, nominate me for invited lectures. Uh, so that's how, how I really um, uh, got uh, to, uh, to start my career and also uh, people who uh, helped to promote my career. So those were really important mentors. Uh, and also uh, in Bell Labs, I le learned the importance of uh, collaboration. Uh, so here uh, were my collaborators um, uh, who I worked together uh, in addition to the people you already have seen, Elsa Rachmanis and Howard Katz. Uh, John Rogers uh, now uh, is uh, uh, he's one of the pioneers uh, on uh, stretchable electronics, uh, biodegradable electronics. Uh, he's in Northwestern. Uh, and uh, we worked uh, side by side in the clean room to produce this uh, first uh, flexible uh, electronic paper uh, that um, 
uh, that that we put out uh, um, uh, at the time in early 2000. And then Christian Clark was uh, another researcher in Bell Labs I collaborated with, uh, who uh, is an expert in growing single crystals uh, uh, and to make really pure materials. Uh, and that was instrumental for our materials development. Uh, so um, uh, there, uh, without the collaboration, we wouldn't be able to really produce uh, this um, uh, first electronic paper. So I learned the uh, really the value and the importance of collaboration uh, at the time. Uh, so by then, um, I was uh, uh, already uh, quite a few years into my independent career already uh, uh, by 2004 was uh, eight years. Uh, and um, uh, it was a uh, time that uh, I moved to academia because um, I found that academia research is really what I was interested in. And also uh, in industry, uh, it was uh, difficult to, to really uh, control exactly what I work on. Uh, so uh, from there, uh, 2004, I moved to uh, Stanford Chemical Engineering Department. Uh, but I starting a new place, I need to define a new research um, uh, direction, uh, but also, of course, uh, leverage what I have done uh, before. And uh, at the time, I could already see that companies uh, starting to produce uh, uh, flexible electronics uh, and uh, wanting to make uh, foldable uh, displays. Uh, so um, uh, I thought that we needed to do something that uh, that is uh, further away in academia. So that's when we started to dream that, well, what what. Uh, else can we do with um, uh, future electronics? And I also wanted to be able to do something that can help uh, human. Um, uh, so I thought that if we can make um, electronics uh, to be invisible, imperceptible, uh, and biodegradable, and uh, also autonomous to be able to measure information um, uh, without uh, uh, us having to, to uh, intervene, uh, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, so that's when we came up with the idea of uh, uh, using human skin as the inspiration to think about uh, how we can build the future electronics. But of course, uh, uh, at the time, still, uh, most of the uh, materials were rigid and brittle. Uh, even for organic semiconductors, uh, they were still rigid and brittle. It's impossible to make them to be skin-like. Uh, so that became uh, the major work that we undertake as the fundamental aspect in the group. Uh, and uh, we made a discovery that was really important uh, that enabled us to now uh, make uh, basically all the uh, organic electronic material, whether it's a conducting material or semiconducting material, uh, to be um, uh, to add the skin functionality such as stretchability, self healing, and biodegradability. But most importantly, without degrading the electronic property, and now in many cases actually boost the electronic property. Uh, so our uh, really important enabling discovery was that um, the nano confinement of the um, uh, organic uh, conjugated polymer was a key uh, that actually removes the, the um, uh, long-standing issue of um, um, disorders, uh, high high degree of disorder in these materials, uh, and uh, that improves the charge transport. But at the same time, if we embed these kinds of uh, nano confined structure in a different matrix uh, that contains the property we want, uh, then we can enable this uh, new form of electronic skin uh, and uh, a new form of uh, uh, display that's uh, stretchable and also um, uh, electrode arrays uh, that can measure electrical signal on uh, uh, creatures uh, that was not possible before. For example, even octopus uh, in addition to the most sensitive region uh, in the human body. And um, uh, so our uh, breakthrough uh, actually uh, the, the this line of uh, study really started uh, uh, 
uh, very early on when I moved to um, uh, to Stanford in 2006. Uh, but our first paper actually didn't come out until uh, 2010. That's when we first uh, uh, invented a uh, sensor that can mimic human touch. And since then, uh, we have been also developing the electronic materials that I mentioned. Uh, then we were able to start building transistors uh, that um, uh, uh, not only take the uh, skin form factor, but also have the um, um, uh, the, the number of uh, units uh, that going from a few thousand to tens of thousand. And then in terms of uh, electronic skin, uh, our first version was able to um, have uh, uh, the sensors we invent and then circuits we wire connect them and then some rigid components, but we were able to show the concept that this kind of electronic skin can actually generate signal to communicate with the brain uh, and uh, cause some movement uh, in the animal. And then uh, with the development of these uh, transistors, uh, materials and fabrication, now our newest version uh, you can see uh, here, it's truly skin-like. Uh, and we are able to turn all the rigid components now uh, into skin-like form factor using the materials we uh, develop uh, and uh, be able to generate signal that our brain can actually uh, understand. Uh, so these are uh, the, the kind of uh, electronics we develop and uh, uh, we uh, uh, look at all kinds of components uh, to make this uh, future wearables and uh, implantables. And in addition to the early sensors, uh, now we have a variety of sensors uh, we can work with. But importantly, um, along the way, uh, I not only uh, learned about um, uh, this new area of research together with uh, my students, uh, but also interacting with students um, uh, and uh, watching how uh, my students develop and the, how they mentor each other. Uh, also, as an advisor, uh, allowed me to, to really uh, see the power of mentorship. I want to highlight one of my former postdocs, um, uh, Helen Tran, who already started her um, own independent um, academic career in University of uh, Toronto. Uh, she really stood out uh, because she took her own initiative while she was in my group uh, to mentor other graduate students and uh, other undergraduate students. So these were uh, a few mentees uh, that she has um, uh, mentored. Uh, and uh, now uh, Vivian is doing a postdoc in uh, MIT and Kathy Liu just started uh, her uh, graduate study in uh, Harvard. And um, uh, through my experience um, uh, watching how uh, mentorship is developing uh, or, or was de developing uh, in my own research group, allow me to see uh, how important not only the advisor to uh, to mentee relationship, but also within the group, the importance of uh, having um, students uh, and postdocs uh, to mentor each other. Uh, so now uh, in my research group, um, uh, we established a former uh, mentorship um, uh, program where all the graduate students and also even postdocs uh, have assigned mentors. Uh, when they uh, join my research group, that was really the learning from um, uh, from uh, Helen. And uh, entrepreneurship, uh, that's again, uh, some learning process. Uh, I see that I talk much longer than I expected. Uh, so uh, I'll quickly go through this um, uh, here. Uh, again, uh, I learned together with my students. Uh, these were uh, my uh, PhD student, Adria Verka, and uh, uh, postdoc, um, uh, Melb, uh, uh, Melbs uh, Lemieux. And uh, they uh, discovered uh, something to uh, in the group uh, to make a nanotube much more conductive. And they wanted to start a company to commercialize it. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, I, I was very happy to uh, to learn uh, starting company with them, and they went to uh, uh, to win this uh, big prize, and that got the company started. And C3 Nano uh, right now is uh, one of the leaders uh, in producing uh, nanomaterials uh, for transparent uh, electrodes uh, and uh, supplying uh, some major companies uh, for touch panels. And another company I started uh, together with my former um, uh, former colleague uh, from Bell Labs, uh, uh, Zina, uh, Dr. Zina Kwan, uh, she's leading the company uh, that was to translate the um, uh, the uh, discovery from my group on touch sensors uh, to uh, for continuous uh, monitoring of um, uh, of babies uh, uh, using these uh, non uh, non invasive devices. And in Stanford, I also had the opportunity to uh, have some leadership uh, experience. Uh, that wasn't uh, uh, something that I planned, but it was really, uh, again, through the uh, mentorship uh, of other leaders uh, in, the, um, uh, in Stanford. Um, uh, first, uh, our provost and the former dean uh, is female, and you can see my uh, dean, current dean is also female. Uh, when the uh, current provost, the former dean, was the dean of engineering, at one uh, meeting when I met her, uh, she asked me, she said, well, Janan, I think you will be great to be a department chair. But at the time, I never thought about being department chair. Uh, but I think uh, her her words about uh, uh, about uh, uh, my potential, I think, was very encouraging. Uh, and the other thing was um, uh, in uh, 2016, I thought it was important for um, uh, Stanford to have a visible uh, initiative uh, that showcase uh, the research that's ongoing, uh, not just in my group, but uh, around campus that's related to wearable electronics. So I went to Persis uh, to ask her to support. Uh, and she said to me, she said, Janai, if you want to do this, I will support you. I'll give you some uh, resources to help you to get started. So that was uh, that support uh, and her encouragement was really important for me to start taking some leadership. Uh, and then uh, the department chair at the time, uh, my former department chair, Eric Shakfe, uh, he um, um, uh, put me as a committee chair uh, to, uh, to uh, look at uh, what's the next five years uh, chemical engineering department uh, uh, most important priorities were. Uh, so that also helped me to develop the um, uh, thinking about vision and the leadership and watching other female leaders uh, to lead the uh, university and the lead the school uh, both uh, uh, again encouraged me to um, uh, to uh, uh, take the leadership. Uh, so that's uh, how I became the department chair uh, for four years uh, and also learned through um, uh, uh, the uh, mentorship of other leaders uh, uh, to, to think about uh, um, uh, uh, this aspect. So again, mentorship was very important. So now I want to just end my talk with uh, a few quick learnings uh, I had throughout this journey. Um, first, uh, uh, looking back, uh, I think there have been, uh, of course, a lot of uh, difficulties and challenges, uh, but it, it was always uh, uh, important uh, that to have a purpose in mind. Uh, the purpose is different from goals. Goals are immediate targets we want to achieve, but purpose is why we want to, to pursue research, why we want to be um, uh, in university. Uh, so to me, uh, learning knowledge and being able to benefit our society was the most important purpose. And also frequently we have to set our priorities and um, uh, make decisions. And when making decisions, uh, having the most important priority uh, in mind is important. And to me, always people uh, are the most important thing to consider in the equation, whether when there's conflict or uh, when there's uh, a argument, uh, then in the end, if I think about who are the most important part, if I think about people, that makes my decision much easier.
follow my heart. Uh, it's sometimes uh, there are so many factors. It's difficult to to, um, to really um, uh, uh, decide. So uh, in my case, I usually follow my heart, and it seems uh, it um, uh, my gut feeling has been leading me um, uh, reasonably well. Um, and uh, also, uh, my philosophy is uh, try my best. And that's all I can do. The outcome is difficult to control and uh, just move forward. Uh, there's no time to regret. And next time I can make a better decision. Uh, but as long as I try my best, uh, this is uh, um, uh, all I can do. And also sometimes uh, uh, there are things that uh, we may consider to be a loss or uh, a disadvantage at the time, uh, but a Chinese philosopher's saying uh, is always something that I use to, um, uh, to, to remind myself. And that was the advice my father gave me when I started my independent career. That is uh, to um, think about potential loss or disadvantage at the time, uh, at the time, you think it's a loss or disadvantage, but it could be a blessing. And uh, that's not just to make myself feel better, uh, but I think um, over the years, I find that really uh, helped me to put things in perspective and allow me to, um, uh, to be able to just make a decision and move on. And usually things turned out to be fine. And finally, uh, we should reward ourselves. Uh, and that's how our brain works. Uh, if we reward ourselves, uh, we will uh, do things, uh, uh, good things, continue to do the good things, continue to do difficult things, and continue to take on challenges. But we always need to stop and reward ourselves uh, so that we can, uh, we can um, uh, uh, continue on this long journey. Because uh, Korea is not just one day exam or uh, not sleep for one night. We can uh, finish something, but rather uh, we really have to um, uh, to to be able to give ourselves some reward. And uh, finally, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do anything without my wonderful group of uh, passionate students uh, over the years. Uh, my group has grown uh, from very small to right now very large. Maybe I'll remove that. And also uh, many uh, collaborators uh, over the years. I put this together uh, a year ago, uh, early this year when I got a Chemistry of uh, Materials Award. I couldn't believe I've worked with so many people people, uh, but it was really the joy of um, getting to know people all over the world and uh, uh, being able to uh, to learn from others and uh, um, uh, to advance knowledge. And uh, also a lot of funding agencies uh, have supported uh, my work over the years uh, and also initiatives in Stanford allow me to pursue new areas. Uh, so those were all really instrumental to uh, my work and the development. Okay, I, I'll stop here so it doesn't leave much time anymore. It's much longer than I expected, uh, but I'm happy to uh, discuss um, uh, any thoughts or questions. Thank you very, very, very much for this very inspiring uh, mentoring talk. I know that um, you have a meeting, uh, you're a chairperson and you're very busy. I'm going to try to combine uh, many questions that are already uh, listed in the Q&A. Um, and uh, um, you guys can uh, enter more questions. We try to answer as many. Um, uh, students in my team uh, uh, have uh, listed a series of questions um, uh, regarding uh, the challenges you face being a, uh, an Asian woman. Um, and uh, hitting engineering. So uh, how hard was it for you um, as a woman, as an Asian person to make it that high? And how did you overcome all of the challenges that you have faced? Mm. Well, I, I think uh, the, uh, the, the, the biggest challenge for, um, uh, uh, for female or for uh, Asian women uh, or for for uh, people who come from a disadvantaged uh, uh, background, is that <laughs> the um, um, uh, the 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 bias uh, that 
uh, that people may not even realize uh, that they had the bias. And um, uh, is this uh, uh, kind of um, um, uh, bias that may potentially limit the um, opportunities uh, that, um, uh, that uh, uh, we might be able to have to realize uh, our potential? Uh, but um, my my philosophy is um, uh, well. There are, we we need to address these issues uh, from the bigger uh, uh, society point of view and uh, change the culture. Uh, but in a short time, it's also very difficult to, to completely change this kind of bias and the culture. Uh, so I, I take a view of um, uh, not focusing on um, uh, the. Um, uh, kind of the obstacles, but focus on uh, the the goal I would like to achieve, and um, uh, and and uh, try to to pursue what I need to do uh, as the most important thing, and not being bothered uh, or try not to get myself bothered uh, by potential bias or obstacle, and um, yeah, so so that that that's how I approach it. Thank you. So I'm going to read a couple of questions uh, quite quickly. This question is from Rami Halabi, is a chemistry senior student here at the AUB. When you were younger, you had to work multiple jobs to cover your expenses and continue your studies in the U.S. What allowed you to overcome the adversities around you and push towards success? Um, I, I think having the goal was really important. Actually, I didn't feel it was difficult or or tough i i actually because uh, coming from another country uh to the us my biggest goal was to really survive in this country and um i never worked in a job before uh, growing up in china so i was very happy that i was able to get a job in a factory and uh, also was able to um uh, to make a living even though on my own, um, and, and also my my goal was to go to graduate school because I knew that I have to get an education in this country in order to survive. And uh, that job, even though I work in multiple jobs, so that was my learning experience and it was temporary. And I have the hope and uh, um, uh, something that I can look forward to. Uh, so, it, yeah, I, I didn't find it uh, really, it was hard. Thank you. This question is uh, from Lina Hajid Yab. Um, she is nutrition undergrad here at AUB. She's curious, if you start all over again, what would you do differently? Uh, I think uh, if I start all over again, um, I would, uh, um, tell myself to be more confident. Um, I think um, um, the um, well, confidence uh, for for many it requires experience to build up, and um, uh, for for me, I think I have to go through something to be confident or to be sure that I'm able to do it. Uh, but then. Um, See, watching, uh, watching how how uh, things um, uh, get carried out, or or how others uh, perform tasks, uh, I found that uh, uh, even though others may have had similar knowledge, or maybe even less knowledge, but the fact that they were more confident allowed them to potentially uh, speak up more or do more. Um, so that's that's what I learned over the years, uh, and um, so I wish I was more confident early on in my career. Um, this question is from Lamise Al Weni. I don't know where she is coming from. Uh, she's uh, thanking you for your inspiring talk during our PhD. So apparently she's doing her PhD. You face big challenges and difficulties along. With the support of your supervisor, how did you use to overcome or face them personally? The uh, uh, I think uh, having a support group uh, was really important. Um, uh, early on in graduate school, it, it was tough. 
uh, because I never had a research experience uh, and also graduate school itself. Uh, uh, the, the courses were tough at the beginning and also experiments were unpredictable. You don't know when you're getting to an end. And uh, so having a really encouraging advisor was important and also friend group. I had a great group of grant friends from uh, my cohort of uh, chemistry department uh, in my year. We would uh, meet every weekend, hang out, and I remember we had the weekly um, uh, $1 uh, milkshake. Uh, that was the break uh, that every Wednesday we would go to get the milkshake. Uh, that's kind of a, a break uh, in the middle of uh, busy experiments. Uh, so all of these um, uh, support was really uh, important and find uh, uh, your own group of support will help uh, uh, be extremely helpful to uh, support each other. Um, there are so many uh, more questions, but unfortunately we will not be able to address them because I know that you have to run to a meeting. Professor Bao, it has been such a pleasure and an honor to host you. Uh, over our platform, uh, we can get enough of you. I have tried twice to get you here to AUB, so I'm gonna try again in the future. Hopefully, we will have the chance to host you in our beautiful campus here at AUB in Lebanon. Uh, I know that you are busy in 2023. Uh, you're already occupied for the spring semester and you're teaching in the fall semester. I Some bird told me this, so I am hoping I will be able to get you here in 2024. With that, I want to tell you that there are attendees from all over the world, and uh, um, it's uh, such a pleasure to have all of you with us. Uh, with that, I want to thank everybody uh, who attended. I want to thank you, and until uh, our next mentoring talk, so long. And here, you can go to your next meeting right on time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks again for giving me the platform to share my story. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody, and you have a good day.